Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, who's here this morning. Uh, it's really such a delight to see so many new and familiar faces. And I want to thank you for showing up on a beautiful Saturday morning to hear about a very important topic. So who am I? Let me introduce myself. I'm Rosette Garcia, and I'm president of the North County League. I like to start my meetings, those of you who've been to a meeting that I lead, with an opening thought, uh, something that centers us and helps us kind of set our intentions for the meeting. And um, what I came up with today is a, a quote from Dorothy Day. I don't know if you know who she is, but she was uh, an American journalist and one of the early social activists in the 20th century uh, who worked um, for many, many years, dedicated her life to fighting hunger and homelessness. And she said, a pebble cast into a pond ca uh, causes ripples that spread in all directions. So I think certainly the league uh, feels like we're always kind of a pebble trying uh, to make positive change and to spread, spread that in the community. So let's keep that in mind as we look at a topic that seems so intractable and so insoluble. Uh, maybe together we can uh, create a ripple that will turn into a wave that will bring some positive change. So why are we coming together on this topic? I just want to quickly tell you that we, our league, got involved or began focusing on this topic back in 2018 when we embarked upon a study which um, ended up with us taking a position and uh, adopting that position. And the overarching goal, the sort of the top priority that the league dis determined um, we wanted to support was permanent supportive housing in order to do, to end this problem of homelessness. That was in 2018. The State League actually took our study and used it sort of as a platform for them to update the state's position and to develop an action plan. That's important because the state deals with state jurisdictions, the legislature, the statewide, um, at the statewide level. We, at the, um, the local leagues, we work with our cities, the county, and the local, all the local jurisdictions. So we're all working together, but focused on different, different jurisdictions. That was in 2018. And just as some context for you, the uh, point in time count, so that's a snapshot of the homelessness, of the, no of the number of people experiencing homelessness in our county. At that time, in 2018, was 8,576 people. Some sheltered most not. Um, so fast forward to today, 2023, the two leagues decided, well, number one, we adopted homelessness as an issue for emphasis. That means we can't work on everything. You know there are many, many, many things uh, that are important and that we'd like to see happen. Um, but we can't do everything. So we pick two or three uh, policy issues. And this past year, we picked housing and homelessness and determined to, to mer decided to merge the, the activities of both leagues into one regional committee. With more numbers, perhaps there's more might, more power. And um, led by Ann, actually, the first thing that uh, they decided to do was to basically get sort of level set to figure out where we were, where our local cities and other jurisdictions were in the fight uh, to get rid of homelessness. And so Anne's gonna tell you a little bit more about that, but that's what happened in 2020, just this past spring. And um, in the intervening years, homelessness went down just a little bit, then we had the pandemic and it's, as we all have been hearing, um, the problem seems just to be getting worse. And the point in time count for 2023 has grown to 10,264. And 
Our experts, I'm sure, are going to tell you a lot more about that, but what I understand is that that number is generally quite an undercount. Um, and in the whole nation, just again, just to provide context, it's estimated that there are about half a million people in the United States who are uh, homeless, many, many of them children. So, um, whoops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> so that's the sort of context, that's the framing. Um, again, thank you for being here. I'd like to pass the microphone to Mary Thompson. She is co-chair of the um, Housing and Homelessness Committee with Miles Pomeroy, who is here in the audience. Um, many, many other hats that she has worn over the years for League. Um, she deserves a much better introduction than that, but I didn't prepare one. But I'm going to hand it over to Mary and we'll get started. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosette. And no, I did not want a long introduction. I am a member of the League of Women Voters North County. I've been active in League's regional committees on public policy housing and transportation since 2018. Since March, I co-chair the Regional Committee on Housing and Homelessness with Miles Pomeroy. Miles? Hi, buddy. So, today, you're gonna hear more about the League's positions on housing and homelessness, which address all aspects of homelessness. For this event, we'll only have time to focus on permanent supportive housing. League positions are based on the League's process of studying a topic, as Rosette told you, reaching consensus, and then adopting and advocating for those positions in the public good. Each of our speakers will introduce us to their organizations, its work, and what it does and doesn't do. Then you'll hear from the Regional Housing and Homelessness Committee's recent study and recommendations being considered. After we hear from the speakers, we'll have about 30 minutes to hear from you about what's been discussed, your questions, your concerns, your disagreement, and your comments on, this, on some of the ideas that we are considering are welcome. Please use the index cards that hopefully you've got in your hand. So our speakers represent essential work that's being done to end homelessness in our region. Tamara Kohler is the Chief Executive Officer of the Regional Task Force on Homelessness, recognized by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, as the Regional's Continuum of Care, COC, you're gonna hear that a lot today, the agency for both the city and county of San Diego, COC administers the Homelessness Management Information System, stand by. Uh, the point in town count and is a regional convener and promoter of best practices in our area's collective efforts to end homelessness. Rebecca Louie is president and chief executive officer of Wakeland Housing and Development, a San Diego based nonprofit which develops and operates affordable housing communities. In February, Wakeland received $68 million from the California Housing and Community Development Organization, HCD, for four separate multifamily housing projects in San Diego and Riverside counties. Wakeland's allocation represents 10% of the total funds awarded and a whopping 78% of the money allocated to San Diego County. Mary Lydon is Executive Director of Home Aid San Diego. Since its founding in March, or excuse me, in uh, yeah, March 2002, Home Aid San Diego has completed 30 projects using in-kind labor and donated materials, equal to over three quarters of the total project costs. The project served more than 300 temporarily homeless individuals. HomeAid's WORKS program provides construction training and job opportunities for people experiencing homelessness while addressing the critical labor shortage in the home building industry. Ann Olmstead 
is a director at large and former president of the League of Women Voters North County. She is an intensely active member of the League of Women Voters California's Housing and Homelessness Interest Group and led the Regional Housing and Homelessness Committee's 2023 study of local homelessness services and action. So let's hear from our speakers in the order that I introduced them and then uh, I'm going to pose some questions to them. So uh, you can advance your own slide. Tamara, you're up. Want to, or you want me to? No, I think I'm going to stand only because it doesn't make that much of a difference. I'm not that tall. Um, but I also could only see this side of the room and didn't want to ignore this side of the room. Uh, good morning. I'm Tamara Kohler, as you heard. Dance. And uh, I really appreciate the introduction uh, because it level sets some of the things I'm going to share with you. It's always important, no matter where I talk about our work, that I want people to understand who we are, why we exist, and what we believe. And I think it's critical uh, as we have a conversation, as Mary explained, we are the continuum of care, but the Regional Task Force is a true nonprofit. And it is also really helpful that we are not embedded in government. So we're not in city government, we're not in county government, not state government, but we are federally authorized. And the advantage of that is we have a really clear mission, role, oversee funding, and primarily we are a planning body by our uh, requirement. So we exist as a sole role, not to deliver direct services, but to organize our efforts in a system approach to address homelessness. That if it happens in San Diego as a region, both city and uh, county, that a homeless experience is rare. Like it is really important that we start thinking about how we do better diversion work or that we really look at how people are experiencing homelessness to reduce the episodes. And that if it does happen that it's brief, that our system is really strong at addressing someone's homelessness. So that length of time is very short and non-reoccurring, which is one of those kind of government speak, but it really means that we sustain them and they stabilize in housing and really recover from that homeless experience and the trauma. I think it's also important, and I firmly believe this, or I wouldn't do this work, that homelessness is solvable. And we need to be grounded in that. It is a solvable problem. It is actually a community who needs to lean into solving it. It is not government only. It is really about a community engagement approach. That ending homelessness begins with a home. I am not solving poverty. I am not solving uh, health issues. I'm not looking to solve a number of other issues that we as a society struggle with. Homelessness is a history of policy uh, challenges. And we're, when you think about it, there are over 600 and nearly 50, 650,000 individuals in San Diego experiencing poverty, extremely low income or no income. That isn't equal at all to the numbers experiencing homelessness. You heard about the point in time count. That is on one single night. It is an undercount because on one early morning, we try and engage, and you know how big our county is, everyone experiencing homelessness, knowing that we're not gonna catch everybody, but it's a very intentional process. Uh, but we also know that all people are successful in housing with the right level of supports, and that's why we're gonna talk about permanent supportive housing. That is true of all of us. It's not just income, it's the supports that help us sustain housing, whether that is personal supports, family, friend, uh, our faith many times will help with things. It's the care that we need within our homes. So anyone, anyone, regardless of what they may be struggling with, is successful in housing with the right level of supports. I'll also just uh, challenge you to think about the fact that the majority of people in poverty are housed and never experience homelessness. The majority of people with mental health or behavioral health issues are housed and never experience homelessness. And I'll also say those that use substance use, whether legal or illegal, I challenge anybody to never have something prescribed to them, right, are housed. And so we need to level set that this is really a housing issue and the way that we address the supports around them. Also that we firmly believe that housing is a basic need, an absolute basic need. And if there's anything that affirmed that, it was a pandemic. When the greatest life-saving um, advice that you were all giving, shelter in, in, shelter in place, stay at home. Not having a home, right, was a, a 
absolute challenge for people to be able to meet their basic needs and stay safe. Also, I think it's important that we understand that homelessness is an experience, it's not a label. It's not what people are, it's something they're experiencing. And as a society, that's something for us that we can attune our thoughts around. This isn't about choice. Many people experiencing homelessness are choosing between really difficult, limited choices. It's not a bad choice. I'm choosing between a lot of really not great options and it's important to, to be level set there. And I think this affirms so much of why you're here that we all believe in San Diego that people should be treated with compassion, respect, and being treated with dignity. One of the largest growing populations that we see is our senior population, our 55 year old, and many of them work their entire lives, uh, very low income, uh, but able to hold on to their housing until there's a traumatic experience, lots of spouse, lots of job, lots of health. You also heard some of the things that as a continuum of care, we are statutorily required to do for this region. There are 44 continuums of care in the state of California. We all are locally focused on issues. So you see RTFH and uh, San Diego as a region, we're unique to San Diego. In Orange County, the continuum of care is unique to addressing those needs. But we have common kind of anchored approaches. And one of those is that we're a planning body. And you heard about the planning that the leads have done and setting forth plans and really structuring the work that you do. That's one of our core responsibilities. So you heard about us, we are responsible for conducting the point in time count. There was a time many years ago that that was the only data that you knew of. Now we put out annual data, we push out data on a regular basis. Most of that coming out of the HMIS system, our providers call it Clarity, that's the name of the software. Out of the HMIS system, it is a unique uh, relational database one client record, all providers working off one client record, and it gives us a clear picture of the numbers experiencing homelessness. We also promote, teach, train best practices. Everything from housing first for our frontline staff that run shelters, outreach, uh, to motivational interviewing, just in time, uh, critical time intervention, to how to run housing focused shelters. And now really leaning into our shelters being age appropriate and thinking about how people can or can't perform their ADL. So we do a lot of training in the community. Uh, there's not a week that goes by that there isn't some level of specific, intentional, purposeful training that's done in your community across the region. And we bring in the top national experts to San Diego to really help us double down. Sometimes help if I have someone who their whole career is in this space to come to San Diego and speak about it. I could say it, our organization will say it, and people will listen, I bring in a national expert and all of a sudden everything we're saying, have you ever had that happen, right? Is like the thing we should do. So we know how to play to our strengths. We operate what is known as the coordinated entry system and this is a little bit in the weeds, but it's a way that our providers organize our understanding of people experiencing homelessness to really prioritize those of greatest need, most vulnerable, those who are really needing the supports that happen in permanent supportive housing. You know, we lean into policy. I do a lot of policy work because policy is partly what got us here. Some really bad policies and challenging ones. We are an advocacy organization. We do a lot of resource research. I do a lot of work on a national level, uh, on a state level as well. I'm in DC about once a month, it feels like, but it's important. That's where we're really leaning in and in Sacramento at a minimum of once a month, but it is also federal policies, state policies, and local ones. Uh, as uh, Council Member LaCava's team knows, I had lunch with him this uh, week. So we meet with our city council. I was in uh, Encinitas at their city council meeting. So we go from the very top all the way to your local meetings as well. That is our role. Uh, the importance of funding homeless programs. We bring in over $35 million annually to a continuum of care. None of it is for our organization. We don't deliver those direct services. But we also pull in another 30 to 40 million every year of other funding sources. One of those being the Bezos Family uh, Day One Fund only goes to nonprofits. We received over $5 million in the last year to address family homelessness. So we bring in resources. I will probably never build a team greater than 30 people. We put this out to the community. It's not about building our nonprofit. It's about really bringing those resources and having the trust and confidence in our providers, which are the ones that are doing that frontline work. 
Uh, we, as I talked about this collaborative application that we do for HUD, that's the 35 million. And then we also monitor the performance of our system and also the gaps, which is some of the work that you guys have leaned into. Having a strong, robust system is what we're really striving for. This is really hard to read. Um, <laughs> It, yeah, you know, even with your good glasses on, it's impossible to read. But the reason I put it up here is we're a planning body, and we adopted uh, last year in October, and I have two boards. I have a community action type organized board, which is the continuum of care. 31 members in your community, everything from elected officials. Uh, Tara Lawson Reamer sits on my board. So I'm telling you, your elected officials to our service providers, to education, to hospitals, to law enforcement, to people with lived experience now make up over 15% of that board. We are serious about this work. It's very competitive to be on that board and have some strong committees. But I also have a nonprofit board because I am a new nonprofit of which uh, Rebecca's on my board. And they are equally committed to the work that we do but our job is a planning body. And so in October, we put out a regional plan. And I think it's important to understand that we also work with the city of San Diego and their plans. I was just in Encinitas, their city's plan we endorse and they pull things from our regional plan to embed in their work because the regional plan of the continua is about best practices. We also organize it around all of the data that we collect to do projections of what are needed in our communities and they're done by your region so it's not so we have central for the city we did uh north both inland and coastal because it is a little different on both uh east and south but the reason i'm sharing this is it's sort of in this box right here uh the needs within the region and we're talking about permanent supportive housing and uh, we know we had about 41,000 individuals that touched the homeless system this last year not all of them are going to need permanent supportive housing uh, with the data and the projections that we did, we need just for the high needs that we have in our community, an additional about 4,400 units. So the reason I'm sharing that is, uh, you know, Rebecca will tell you a lot about what they've been able to bring in. That is not what we need to address affordable housing. That is for the high need, most vulnerable, permanent supportive housing. That isn't the arena goals. That's not going to get you there. But this is how we save the loss of life. This is how we really take care of the greatest need. But we also projected rapid rehousing, which is almost three times what we need in permanent supportive housing. Our low income housing, just for those experiencing homelessness, it's really an income issue. It's not that other level of care. Uh, we also organize our work around populations because funding comes through populations. So veteran homelessness, if we could just get enough units, Right? Veterans would be rare, brief, and one time because we have enough resources. We have a commitment to end family homelessness. That is something that San Diego should really lean into. We should have no families experiencing homelessness. Children need to be connected to their schools. They need to be connected to their community, our aging population, and our unsheltered. But we organize all of this, and then we work with our electives, and we work with individual cities to pull the things out of these plans that work for them? And then what funding do they need? How can they help organize their providers? How can we help them write for grants and be able to organize that? So this regional plan, um, this was supposed to be a one-pager, and that's what we got. Two <laughs> fabulous, hard-to-read uh, um, one-pager that bled into two. But it also tells you the practices that we're looking for, what we affirm, housing first, how people need to come together, and how we align funding. It is a really robust report. I would love you to read it, but if you don't, uh, I think really organizing yourself and understanding this two-pager really tells you how we do our work. What are the practices, policies, and principles? What are the projected need? And what are the populations that we strive um, to support? One of the things that we do well but it is not the only thing that we do, is really put out data that helps us understand our environment. And one of the things we did in this last year is put out a report. Uh, it's, a lot of people call it the inflow outflow one. Um, I rarely get to talk about it because in community meetings, almost everyone quotes some of the things from uh, this report. We did an annual look back and found that for every 10 people we housed, 13 more were experiencing homelessness for the very first time. You've probably heard your elected use that, right? It, it, but what it really level said is the things that we're doing work. We are housing folks. We're ending homelessness. 
but the demand on this system is greater than we are able to meet those needs. But this report really, and we put it out monthly, tells you the first time homeless. So if you really think about in San Diego as a region, right, nearly 1,200 people. That is 55 or older. That is our families. That is our Tay population are experiencing homelessness this last month for the very first time. It is one of the most scary, traumatic, challenging experiences that they will ever have. We also ended homelessness for 828 people. San Diego as a region actually does a really good job of addressing homelessness and, and, and connecting people to housing resources. We just don't have the housing there uh, to really meet those needs. Over 4,000 of those individuals of the entire system were enrolled into new programs. That means they're engaging with someone, they've been assessed, we know what they need to end their homelessness. If you think about that as a region, over 4,100 new people really being connected to the services that they need. We organize how many individuals are active each month in our system. So as I said, over 41,000 people touched our system. But uh, last month in July, almost uh, you know, 27,000 and change uh, were being served in this homeless system. It's bigger than 10,000 people at any given time. A significant amount of those are connected to housing resources. So we push this out. Uh, we're going to start doing this by the populations that you see, so the seniors, families, Tay, and veterans. And then at the bottom you can see who found housing. We're doing a good job, a little bit better with our seniors, not nearly enough on our families and a little bit on our veterans. So just want to give you a little bit about that. And the reason that I share this is we need to understand what we need. We are not only talking about permit supportive housing, but the housing has to be geared to the needs we see in the community. And when we target too much of it for just people with serious mental illness or too much for people with substance use, uh, many of those are not uh, being able to be housed in a lot of Rebecca's uh, work. And I'll just leave you with one last thought. Um, we do this work to support people who are experiencing homelessness. We have a lot of people who have lived experience that inform our work. Um, and uh, this comes from uh, one of the best advocates in this work uh, through Invisible People. And I will always end with their voice, that homelessness isn't a single problem. It's a symptom of many problems. Policy choices on health, housing, policing, discrimination, and labor have helped shape this crisis. We don't pay enough, we don't support enough of our health issues, and our housing costs uh, are out of reach. But as any sector, when we talk about homelessness, we're too often starting from a place that isolates homelessness as an issue from all of these other forces. And that's why I think the research that you have done, the importance of understanding that people experiencing homelessness are struggling with multiple things at the same time. But what we need to solve their issues is adequate and appropriate housing, not necessarily the stigma and bias around what was a choice, because many of them, I guarantee, did not say, someday I'm gonna be homeless, that's my choice, right? Um, and so the way that we solve these issues is really grounding and listening to what they're telling us, but also the data that helps us know. And, and uh, Rebecca's programs for all of their permit supportive housing programs, they, they are required to coordinate with the continuum of care to project what that need is and to understand, is it seniors? Is it with mental health? Is it substance use? To be competitive for that state funding. And unfortunately, it takes us a while to build those. So we're trying to project out what those needs will be. So sort of a high level of a number of the things that we do. Uh, and I'm going to, I think Rebecca's after me, right? <laughs> Hi everyone. So I'm Rebecca Louie with Wakeland Housing and Development Corporation. Um, a little bit about Wakeland. So since our formation back in 1999, we've built over almost 7,600 affordable homes in 53 different housing communities. Um, our mission is, we're actually changing this right now. I'm gonna test it out on you. Our new mission is to transform lives and communities using affordable and supportive housing. This one's too long, boring. Uh, these are some of the projects that we've done. Um, in downtown San Diego, we've got Parkside. It's, it was a partnership with a church that was family affordable. Um, Amani Apartments is one we just opened in LA. It's all for formerly homeless seniors, um, about half of them with a diagnosed serious mental illness. 
Mission Heritage Plaza, so cool in Riverside, downtown across from the library. It has included uh, 74 family units. Uh, half of those are actually set aside for veterans. Half of those are veterans experiencing homelessness. Um, and included in it is a civil rights institute. Um, so that's a little bit we do. What, what is affordable housing? I think this crowd kind of knows this, but generally, you know, it's housing for people that are low income and it tries to set their rents or housing prices at costs that are affordable then. So you've got a little bit of money actually to go spend in the world and not all of your money going to rent, which is the case for so many, so many of our San Diego residents. Supportive housing just goes a little bit further. So it says, okay, it's affordable housing, but it's also for people then who's gonna need a little bit more help staying housed. So it's usually targeted to people experiencing homelessness and it comes with a whole array of services to help them thrive once they're in the housing and make sure they stay housed. And as we said, stability, autonomy, dignity. The benefits, well, housing solves homelessness. Once you're in a house, you're not homeless anymore. So all these communities like to say, oh, you're gonna put all these homeless people in my neighborhood. I'm like, I'm not putting a single homeless person in your neighborhood. I'm putting house people in your neighborhood, right? <laughs> Fools. Um, improves housing stability, improves health. They're, no, they're not gonna get healthy on the streets, right? You're not gonna get healthy while you don't have a place to sleep at night. Think of the time you were the most sleep deprived and think what it did to your health immediately immediately how you felt. And then think of that going on for years. No one gets healthy until they're in houses. They come into my places, shut the door behind them, get a good night's sleep, and you see their health improve within days. It's a miracle, housing is a miracle. It lowers all the costs, shelters, hospitals, emergency services, psychiatric centers, all the inefficiencies that come with people being unhoused go away once they're housed. Enhances the community. My projects are beautiful, as I'll show you. Community service opportunities, all kinds of things you can come do at my projects and help people out. Okay, this is LA, I'm lazy, I didn't switch this slide, but you get it, there's a ton of need everywhere. Every single city, it's funny, every single city I go to thinks they're the only one struggling with homelessness and every single city is struggling with homelessness in a big way across this state. And the services that come with what we do, um, supportive housing really works. So 96% of the people in our supportive housing projects voluntarily participate in services. This has been this rhetoric that drives me crazy around a lot of this is, oh, people don't choose. If you make it voluntary, we need to force people into treatment. They shouldn't be allowed to be housed if they're not gonna be forced and forced to do all of these things. Well, you can't force people to fix their lives. You can't force people into recovery. You can't force people to get sober any more than any of us could be forced to fall, solve our bad habits, right? If I could force you to start running 10 miles a day or force you to stop drinking, it would, you know, we'd have a lot less problems in society. Well, they choose to because they want to, because once they get in, they really want to. And then our retention rate, which I'm super proud of, is 97%. So people that come in our housing stay housed once they're there. These are some of the examples of some of my Pride and Joy projects. This is Talmadge Gateway. This is one of the first ones that we opened, 60 units total. It's right on the border of kind of City Heights and Talmadge. Um, it was the first project in San Diego exclusively for seniors experiencing homelessness with chronic health conditions. We partner with St. Paul's PACE program, which is the program of all-inclusive care for the elderly. So when the seniors come into us off the streets, they get A to Z medical care, they get case management from Father Joe's Villages, and the residents there are thriving. And as you can see, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. There's some of our residents. Um, you, um, you laugh, you probably all met Bruce. Every single person is raised by some point met. These, a lot of our residents of this project have become advocates. So they've gone, they now have, some of them have their own lived experience companies where they go around and, and provide their experience to people so that they can inform, so that we're not housed people making decisions or what we think people need, but really listening to people who've actually been housed, homeless. There's some of the activities that we put on. This is Atmosphere downtown, 205 units total, 51 are set aside for people that were homeless, 31 have a diagnosed serious mental illness. Got all kinds of classroom spaces. Trinity Place, my new beloved, this one's in Grantville, 60 units total, again for seniors experiencing homelessness with chronic health conditions. My gosh, they're thriving, it's amazing. The Beacon, downtown San Diego, across from City College. This one has, it's 43 units, I think, and half of them are set aside for people with diagnosed serious mental illness, and half of those are transition age youth, also thriving. I was warned about them. They're like, they're young, they're energetic, and they've never, <laughs> never had any supervision. They've done great. So we put a lot of thought into our design. It's something I always like to just kind of show pretty pictures, because one of the really things that people can do that's helpful to me is when you hear that I am coming to your neighborhood, you can show up and support me and you can say, hey, go see their projects before you talk about it. Go see their communities because I'm always the nicest thing in town. 
Um, we have a, like really cool security systems. I've got these cameras. You can come up if you're in the system already. The doors open for you if you're like in a wheelchair. We use wayfinding, so we've got different colors on every floor so you know where you are. Um, just kind of we get their units really ready for them so that they can come in off the streets. It's a journey to get there. I mean, by the time I've gotten like my construction times down, they've gotten through the system. I mean, these people have been waiting months and months to come in, lots of changes, lots of drama. So we make sure they can come in, uh, sleep on fresh sheets, have food in their freezer waiting for them. It's pretty beautiful. When they come in, we leave them cute notes. Sorry, I did that one. Yes, food. Oops, let me see. So that's time to homemade. So that's really, that's just really getting involved. Um, th that's really what we're doing. And it's just to kind of, I think I was asked to kind of do a little big picture, like what do we need? Affordable housing and supportive housing, really the, the strong key to it. It's deeply subsidized. There's no way around it. Everyone wants to try to come up with some new way that we're going to get around this that doesn't cost an extraordinary amount of money. But when you're talking about people who have, you know, basically zero money or possibly if we're lucky, they're going to get hooked onto their social security or disability or veterans payment. Maybe they're going to make $1,200 a month. And if they're paying a third of that towards their rent, that's not enough to sustain an apartment complex. So you have to have that subsidy. If you think like what you can pay for your mortgage, what they can pay for our mortgage is very low. <laughs> like, so we've got to get that gap filled in. It's an expensive, it's something that jurisdictions, local, state, federal need to commit to very deeply. And it's something we never do. Funding for affordable and supportive housing in San Diego and really everywhere is maddening. It's the most ridiculous system you've ever seen. They put out different pots every year if you're lucky. You can't plan around it. There's no consistency. You don't know what's coming. I tie up land in one place just hoping maybe there's going to be funding available by the time I get it ready. But I have to invest a bunch of money. So it's just this like goofy. Sometimes we end up, the one I talked about in Riverside ended up with like 13 different funding sources by the time it was done. So it took us 10 years to get it even compile all of the money. I've got another one in National City, same thing. I've been working on it for a decade. I've had to pull together nine different funding sources so far. I think it's going to get funded. <laughs> so that's really our, our, our big thing. And there's going to be some things coming before you in San Diego to approve some revenue measures that I'll be back to talk to you about. Well, good morning. My name is Mary Lydon. I am the executive director for Homemade San Diego. Um, I got to say, listening to Tamara and Rebecca, um, I have more hope right now. Um, I really do. Um, and something that Tamara said about this is a community issue, that's exactly right. Um, we have to all work together on this. It is not just about po policy. Um, it is because that takes forever to really catalyze um, more housing. We need it, but it takes a long time. And there's lots of things that we can all do individual, individually, engage with our communities, um, our churches, our community development organizations, the League of Women Voters. And it's going to take all of us to um, get on top of this problem, and we can do it. And I do have more hope today listening to these ladies. Um, Homemade San Diego, um, we really uh, catalyze the building industry to do good. Um, we work with nonprofit organizations um, at the continuum of services in our, in our region. We've been around for 20 years here in San Diego and almost 40 at the national level. We have 19 affiliates across the country who are working with the building industry to contribute discounted and donated materials to lower the cost of building um, housing and other programmatic facilities um, that will um, help um, our service providers uh, uh, help people rebuild their lives. Um, so we're really helping to catalyze the building industry to do good. And I came on board two years ago because I think they can do a whole lot more. And so I'm excited about the role that we're playing here in San Diego, working with our, our social services providers. We work in three different areas. We call it builds, cares, and works. 
um, our builds program uh, uh, again is working with uh, social service agencies on, on small building projects. Um, we're a small nonprofit here in San Diego, um, but we are, we're a model for engaging our communities to be part of the solution. Our CARES program is probably our first entryway into working with companies to introduce them to the issue of, of homelessness and the great challenge that we're facing here in our region and across the country. Um, we may do um, um, little projects uh, with social service agencies and build, bring uh, companies to them to do painting projects or landscaping projects. Um, we do a, a, a hygiene kit assembly um, that we then give to social service providers who are working directly with homeless um, individuals. Uh, but we do this as a way of education uh, because we know, I mean, listening to Rebecca this morning, it's like, oh, I didn't know that, you know, and I've been in this world for a while now. Um, before homemade, um, I was um, focused on uh, affordable housing policy. I actually work with the League of Women Voters here in San Diego on, on the uh, homelessness and housing um, action plan. So I've been around it for a long time. But if I, if there's things, key things that I don't know that I heard today, um, there's a whole lot more that people who aren't as connected to this don't know. So it is, it's important that we educate and, uh, and having a presentation like this morning to all of us, I think will um, help us all. But we do, we do it at Home Aid in a little different way. Engage corporations at large to do good. And they want to. There's certainly, there's much more of a focus, I think, um, with, with the next generation, um, and especially coming out of the pandemic. Um, companies, the employees of companies, they want their companies to do good. You know, how can the employees connect to the, com use the companies to connect to the communities to do all kinds of good things? That's really a wonderful thing. So, um, uh, that's a part of our CARES program. And then our WORKS program is a workforce development program. So let me just tell you a little bit about some of those. Um, these are some of the social service agencies that we've worked with um, over the years. Um, homeless agencies, um, serving seniors, Terry, they're a, a large organization in North County that works with developmentally disabled individually individuals. Um, most recently, Rise Up Industries, um, they're in East County. They have a workforce development program where they train uh, formerly incarcerated individuals um, to get into uh, manufacturing. Uh, so that's just, those are a few of the agencies we've worked with. Um, these are a few examples of our builds uh, projects. Um, more recently, um, we worked with Shoreline Community Services. Um, they put together um, a drop-in center for um, homeless individuals in the beach communities. There was nothing. There was there were no um, services in the beach beach communities. So this is the first one, and we helped bring all kinds of donated um, products. Um, they had a general contractor that deeply discounted um, re rehabbing this uh, nice little uh, uh, building adjacent to a church. Uh, we finished uh, five units for Home Start here in San Diego. Home Start is an outstanding organization that works with families um, who are um, survivors of domestic violence. Took a, a big old house in, in, uh, in University Heights and converted it into five units. So five families are there now. Um, wonderful. We helped save them a couple hundred thousand dollars on that little rehab. And then uh, the Terry Vocational Center in uh, North County. Terry is doing a whole um, campus of life, they're calling it. They have an, a, a really incredible model. Rather than just moving um, disabled individuals to the sidelines and live in their own world, they're creating this whole campus that's connected to the community at large and really making them belong to the community at large. So it's a really beautiful model for people who are different, who have disabilities, who are autistic, um, and we can extend that into the homeless arena too, people who have been 
traumatized by being homeless or other things in their lives, how do we incorporate them into the community at large? Terry's doing a great job. Um, our CARES program, again, we work with um, a lot of folks in the building industry, um, Swinerton, CNS, Gensler, LPA, and architects, and many others. Um, we, we do a lunch hour, we'll come in, talk to their, their teams, and they do a little activity, so, um, and then help us deliver those um, hygiene kits to the nonprofit organizations that we work with. So just giving them an, an experience of engaging, contributing to the solution. Um, our new program is called WORKS. Um, we, this came about because we want to take a little deeper um, step into helping uh, people rebuild their lives uh, more directly. And so we created a workforce development program uh, for the construction industry. Most of our uh, members and supporters and sponsors are in the construction industry, the, the building industry and construction industry. There's a great shortage of workers right now. Um, but construction jobs have a nice little career ladder. And so if you don't have a college education um, or you're rebuilding your lives, this is a way for you to really um, get into um, a career um, that has a future. And so we've graduated about 50 um, students in the last year and a half. Um, we've gotten about 50% of them um, employed in jobs um, with the job partners that we work with. Um, it's, it's challenging, um, but we feel like we're really making a difference with those who are successful. Um, we do a walk every year um, to uh, bring our community together and again to continue to uh, uh, educate about the issue of homelessness. Um, we, you know, our work is really to engage our communities at large in, in, in this issue and to find solutions uh, of, our, of, of your own uh, within your communities or within your companies. And we're just a small little group that's working to try to help catalyze solutions around the issue of homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I'm feeling really overwhelmed right now. Um, what we have been doing at the local level is what I'm supposed to be talking to you about today. But first, I want to acknowledge how much we've learned just listening to this. I mean, I would say that I have probably spent a significant amount of my life in the past six months studying homelessness in San Diego County. and. <laughs> Wow, I've learned so much. It's so great. Anyway, um, let me first of all remind you all that we did adopt a position and we did decide that we would, as a league, we would emphasize certain aspects related to supporting homelessness, or not supporting homelessness, but supporting eradicating homelessness. And the first of those was house, um, Housing First, I'm, I'm, Housing First was our very first target goal. And guess what? The federal and the state government passed laws saying you can't have our money unless you practice Housing First. Yay. So we kind of won that without having to do anything. That was great. But we had other goals in our position that we wanted to deal with. Those included things like what kind of services are being offered? What kind of policing is being done? Um, and most importantly, what can we do to get to permanent housing for our homeless population? So what we did at the Housing and Homelessness Committee is we decided to take a look at what cities are doing because cities are where homeless people interact on a daily basis with the people that they're living with and around. The police, the stores, the population who are walking up and down the streets, they're the people that they are having to see and how they're treated by the city can have a significant impact on their quality of life while they're being unfortunately unhoused. 
So what we did was we formed a crew and I want to acknowledge the people in the room that were part of that crew. Thank you very much. Your research was invaluable. Um, and what we did was we had a specific list of things we were looking at. One of the things we did, oh, thank you. There you go. Yeah. One of the things that we did was we focused on looking at cities' agendas for the past two years to try to identify what have cities been doing related to homelessness. Um, and that was a revelatory experience. Um, we also took a look at what kind of media their local police had related to homeless incidents. We also then realized that the money that's coming in is spread in a, uh, an interesting way throughout our county. Um, a city with a sophisticated staff, for example, is able to write a sophisticated grant proposal to HUD or to one of the state agencies. What about if you're a smaller city? You don't have that kind of, of, of staff leveling. You just don't have the money to pay for that person. Well, how do you deal with that? That's tough. Cities, um, my printer didn't print my first page of my speech, so I'm kind of punting at this point. <laughs> so I'm gonna look at my slides right now. The money that comes in was incredibly interesting. It's diverse. It comes from many, many, many different funds. It comes from many different levels. It goes, it flows through the regional task force and the COC, and thank God for them. Who knows what would happen if we didn't have them? Um, so where we went, yes, we wrote a report. The report will be available on our website very shortly now. Um, it's still slightly in the preliminary stage because our recommendations are slightly in the preliminary stage. We really wanted to hear what the ladies had to say. And um, I think there's going to be a couple changes. But what, what do we think we should be doing as a result of the work that we've done at our very, very local level? Let me show you. Overall, given our findings, it's totally clear that there needs to be a systematic, coordinated effort on the use of the money that comes to this county to help people who are homeless. I totally agree with the, the, the statement that the community needs to lean into it. Of course we need to lean into it, that's obvious. But we need money to help do that. Um, it, th there is no other way to get to the goals that we need. You can't build permanent housing without money. And guess where the money comes from? But once the money gets to our county, how is it used? How is it um, diffused amongst the entire population? Why should a city that's sophisticated have its residents, if you will forgive me, receiving better service, so as to speak, than a, a city that doesn't have as much sophistication. There should be, in our opinion, a, a, a way throughout the entire county for everyone to receive services. No person, because they don't happen to live in the right place or, or are homeless in the wrong, at the right place, should not, they should not be able to access the services they need, the permanent housing that they need in order to um, return to a, a, a more stable lifestyle. So I know we're running late. I think I've covered everything I was supposed to. I'm not too good on slides. Oh, good. That's where we are. Thank you so much. Ashley, we've got all the time in the world till 12 o'clock. So, so um, I love the, the spirit that I heard, which was, I think I'm getting some hope here um, from these speakers. Uh, who, knew, who would have thought coming to this conversation about a topic that we thought was so dire that we could leave here with a bit of hope? So um, I'm really glad. Uh, we did prepare a couple of questions, and I'm going to pose them to our panelists, to our speakers. We're going to take about 15 to 20 minutes to do that. 
And then we're going to save the rest of the time for questions from you, questions, comments, concerns um, about what you've heard and maybe maybe you don't like what some of what you heard. We're going to try and have all of that aired because as Anne said, the things that are in the report and the recommendations that are being proposed are being considered and there's room for us to learn and that's what today is all about. So I'm going to pose some questions and don't fight Oliver who gets to speak. You all get to speak if you want to. So I'm going to start with um, an easy question. Um, what do you see as the root causes of the unhoused crisis? And what are the biggest controversies? <laughs> do we have the rest of the afternoon? <laughs> Till noon. <laughs> well, I'm just going to level set. I think it's a question I get often, like what is the root cause of homelessness? Uh, and, and it truly is a lack of affordable housing. Because we're, as I said at the beginning, we're not trying to address all the health issues or poverty or those kind of things. And I can tell you there are communities across this nation that have much more affordable housing stock and capacity, higher levels of poverty, higher levels of mental health, higher levels of substance use issues and death by fentanyl, and do not have the homeless numbers that we have here in San Diego. So I just want to level set that it is truly uh, a space of not having adequate uh, housing that everyone can afford in a community, not just those on very little or uh, no income, and then also having the stock of that housing, uh, which is one of the, I think, most important things. I think one of the controversies I'm bumping up against the most right now that I hear the most sort of in the media and that I hear when I'm going around and stuff is is homelessness the fault of the people that are homeless? And there's a lot of elected officials that are really leaning into that, this idea that this is a choice, that somehow they are choosing it. And they'll say like, oh, well, you know, we offer, we asked them, do they want to be homeless? And they said, yes. And I said, did you have a house to offer them? <laughs> you know, they're not fools. They know you don't have anything. They know there's nowhere for them to go. And the idea really that like housing first doesn't work is something that's being floated a lot around that, you know, I had an elected official look me in the eyes and say, well, if housing first works, why, why are more people becoming homeless? Why are we, why are we housing 10 but getting, you know, 13, you know, experiencing homelessness for the first time? And I said, well, it's super stupid because it's, we haven't done enough of it, right? So it's like giving out three umbrellas in a rainstorm to 3,000 people and saying umbrellas don't work. But people like that idea. They like the idea. It, it makes us feel better when we're seeing what we see because we see horrible things, right? Every day it's heartbreaking. You go downtown, it's heartbreaking. And I think to survive that, to harden your heart, it's much easier to think it's their fault. They did it. It's their drug abuse. It's their alcoholism. It's their, and it wouldn't happen to me because I'm, I'm a decent person. I do my drinking in my house late at night, you know, behind my door. You know, I'm not here doing it in the streets. You know, like, I had my parents to bail me out when I got in trouble when I was young, you know, like all the things. I bought my house in 1960 when, you know, I, you know I, nobody helped me. You know, get a lot, I hear a lot of that. And I think it's letting them, ourselves off the hook. I think it just makes it easier if you can think it's their fault. I think we have to continuously push back on that notion. Like Tamara said, it's a housing thing. It's there's these, yes, people are always going to have these societal problems. It also kills me when people say, um, well, we need to get to all the other root causes first, right? So I'm like, okay, well, what are you doing then? Are you fixing mental health, poverty, you know, a, a, a justice system, you know, like that's super broken, policing, the historical racism, like are you going to get to all those things before we house people? Like let's house them first. Maybe, maybe then you can solve mental health and all the things that have been, you know, plaguing us in poverty, that have been plaguing us as a society forever. So. I agree that um, housing uh, is our biggest challenge, expensive housing um, in a coastal city uh, that's constrained by mountains and ocean and the Camp Pendleton. Um, our land is very expensive, so housing is the solution. Um, how we got here, it's been brewing for decades. Um, the pandemic uh, has been a catalyst, um, not only in San Diego, but in this country. Um, we are transforming as a country. Um, and it's transforming how we work, um, who's in charge, uh, how we uh, have our, our, our civic dialogue, 
uh, our issues, um, what's going to be acceptable in the future. Um, you know, we have we have to there's we have to have common rules um, in a, in a civil society, and right now we don't have common rules. Everyone's playing by their own rules, and so our civil society is messy right now. But I am convinced that we are in a transformative time, and we're going to come out of this with a new understanding of how we are going to live in a civil society, how our democracy is going to work. It's a great reset that's occurring right now. Um, and it's connected, it all trickles down to housing in many, many ways. So that's my answer. I think I can, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, just, I just want to add one more. Yeah. The, the idea that you don't want something in your community is <laughs> our Achilles heel. Right? If you want to solve homelessness, then you want to look at your transformation in your community and what that looks like. It means density, right? It means we're going to, because it's so expensive. And I think if you really want to end homelessness, then you have to say yes to all of the things that it takes to cite the level of housing that people need that is close to, you know, your city centers. It, this idea that, well, we need to put somebody out way out here, that, that especially when transportation is an issue, connection to health, all of those kind of things. So it also is, as a community, embracing change in our communities that give us that culture and that richness of having multiple people with multiple uh, experiences of housing and needs in your community and caring for one another. You know, it takes 10 years to get the, the dollars to house something and a community pushing back that they don't want that in their community is based in so much fear about, and most of it is they're fearful that this might happen to them, but because of their good choices, right? Like this is, this is just a, a narrative that we need to stop and we need to change the narrative that California is a welcoming place to live. You want your children, your grandchildren, you want to age here, you want to have housing that meets the needs and is built in a way that, that really adds rich culture to the work that we do. You can go to a lot of European countries where they have density in a lot of places and we adore it. So I think changing our mindset is critical too. So we want to say yes is the right answer. Um, what about retaining, retaining uh, low income housing? You know, whether it's preservation or how can we retain and maybe keep from gentrifying? We know we want to build more, that's the easy answer, but what do we do with what we've got? And so how, what are some of your ideas? Maybe we'll start with um, Rebecca and, and Mary, you're in the building world. How do we either renovate or retain what we've got? I mean, I hate to be a broken record on this, but it's financial. Again, you know, it really is. It's just we're in a very time of limited resources. So the cities, you know, have this only, and, and state and federal, there's only a certain amount of money and they always are trying to prioritize. So right now, a lot of that priority is going because we're seeing so much street homelessness and such a crisis before our eyes. Now, so much of our funding is dedicated to permanent supportive housing. So I, I love it because I love building it. I love operating it. It's, you know, it's what I do, but I also wish there was more funding I have a whole affordable housing stock that is getting older and there's not really the funding available for it. Um, so having those targeted programs that are, are for preservation would be great. It's just, it's a resource constrained society. Well, naturally occurring affordable housing um, is very important and we, we should do an inventory um, of where that is, what the numbers are, Total criteria for what meets that, and as a as a as a region, uh, dedicate ourselves to making sure that those housing units uh, stay in place, stay affordable, and it will require money because we don't want the total deterioration of naturally occurring affordable housing. Uh, I mean, that many times is why it's affordable is because it's not you know that great. But we, we need to make sure that it's maintained and that it's livable and it's a great community. Um, so it's important to do that. Uh, I just want to add another yeah, piece on it. sort of this housing. Like we need all of it. We have communities and we don't have a trailer park here. 
explained to you that it's really affordable housing for someone on a fixed income. If it's the quality of it, that's something we can work on. Uh, we removed almost all of the SROs in this community. Those were, you know, incredibly affordable. So it's not just retaining the affordable housing that some of them are getting to a certain age, but we've got to stop pushing back on housing that is affordable. And if it's a quality of a space, investing in that, rather than just saying that's an eyesore and I don't want it here. And that is really sort of community pushback in a lot of ways. If we continue to lose some of the very, you know, naturally occur, uh, occurring affordable housing, that's what we're talking about. It is, if you think about it one time, we have a lot more, you know, places where people could put mobile homes. We don't need more and they are being bought up and they're being by big dollar corporations and they are changing uh, that landscape and not keeping it affordable. So I'm telling you every place that those exist in your communities is the housing we have to retain. Let's stick with money just a bit longer. So despite the vast government funding to address homelessness, the problem's getting worse. Um, so what are the creative market-driven approaches that might apply? And then another sort of sub question is, what do we do with the money? How do we divvy it up between shelters, transitional housing, or permanent supportive housing? It's a big, big complex problem. We don't have much time. So um, take it away. I mean, everybody says there's this vast amount of money out there. It's kind of not that vast and it's been really sporadic. So like, it's like, okay, we'll do something big for a couple of years and then it's gone again. So you can't really plan around it. It goes, it's, it, it goes to a wild different thing. And I mean, we know, I mean, there's been studies then showing if California really wants to address its housing crisis, it needs to dedicate $5 billion a year forever towards it. Like that's the only way we're gonna get the amount of like subsidized. So I'm gonna hear a lot like, oh, we're throwing all this money in, like it's just getting worse. It's so it's just so disorganized. Like it's just such a so we to, we can't plan. I mean, yeah. my God, those social service agencies, they have to reapply for their funding every single year, every single year. So, but, but, but imagine that. Imagine you run a business. <laughs> it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, so I would say that. Like I, I've always pushed back a little bit on the, the vast amounts. You know how we prioritize it. I don't know. I'm, I'm scared to hear my I'll also say that you know what the challenge that we have across the nation at California. Uh, in, in a terrible way. The state budget has not dedicated housing for this. I mean, if we just dedicate 3% of the state's budget, 3%, we could address this. The other challenge is not only the one-time funding, but if you think of a retirement account, if you don't invest in it anywhere in your 20s or 30s or 40s, and now I'm in my 50s, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. And I think we need to wrap our heads around that. We haven't invested when this, the challenge was small, when it was easier, when housing was even more affordable. Yes, there's a lot of money going into it, but it is not keeping up with the demand and the need either. And I challenge you to find any other social safety net that when more people need it, we question our, were we good with the money that we receive and maybe we should fund it less, not more. Like that is a, that's a headspace we need to really wrap our heads around. We don't create the trauma that causes homelessness. We, we are not in that space, but to look at the homeless system and the housing that's needed and saying, you know, we've given you lots of money, but the problem's getting worse. I challenge you in any other industry that that's the narrative. If there's greater need in the healthcare, we build more. We have more hospitals, we have more doctors. Think about it in that lens and we'll get the funding we need to then get to a place where the investments are consistent and not as much as needed in big spaces over time. So, so Mary, God. you've done a lot with the little, so tell us how you did it. I just want to say one thing really quick, <laughs> like on the next time, people always go, oh, you're in affordable housing, you do homeless housing, you must be doing great right now. You must be like, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 the state's gonna have zero money for affordable housing next year. They've been consistently telling us. Zero money are they gonna set aside for affordable and supportive housing, which we rely on to actually get built. So I have a pipeline full of projects that but for money could go. I've gone through, I've bought the community, I've done my, I've got my zoning correct. I've owned the land, like I've, it's designed, like I'm ready to go and they're just sitting there and it's me and every developer. So people wanna kinda do a lot of stuff around the edges, oh let's change zoning, maybe we can do this. That's all like important, but it really is, like the, the resources are not there. In any I think that there's one other avenue from a market-driven perspective. We need innovation in real estate development. Uh, there's not enough innovation. It's like, how can we reduce the cost of building homes? 
Are there new products? Are there new systems? Are there new ways that we can get structures up more quickly um, and build more housing uh, more efficiently? I don't know that there is a, uh, a motivation on builders' parts um, to innovate because that could be that could be expensive to take time out to to innovate and figure out a new system. They'd rather just do what they've always done and keep doing that because they know how to make money doing that. So I think that's a big piece that's missing. Um, I'm part of um, a committee on the, the World uh, Design Capital that the city of San Diego was designated. And we're gonna do a whole series of events on uh, innovation uh, in the built environment, mm -hmm. specifically around housing. So um, one of the threads that came up was the whole idea of um, the social aspects, whether social policies such as criminalization, coerced care, or other interventions, what role do they have in this vision that we all think we have of permanent supportive housing? How do these um, things that are emerging in our society, how do they affect this ability to get there? Criminalizing homelessness actually makes the journey harder and longer and can actually make it so someone doesn't qualify. So anytime we arrest and someone is not able to meet that court appearance and they get a warrant, then many times the housing is now, you can't have someone with an existing warrant or having that space. And they don't keep them, that's not housing. So not only many times in that sort of space, arresting them, they, you don't get to take all your stuff with you. So most of their stuff is thrown away. I need all of that documentation to get them housed. They need their uh, personal documents to get there. So, and it's been proven, I've done this work for a while. Every time a community leans into a greater level of enforcement that includes arrest and incarceration, not only does it make it harder for us to build the trust with folks, but they lose all of their stuff, which makes it harder for us to house them. There is no benefit to it when it comes to addressing homelessness. Um, yeah, no, strongly, strongly agree. I meet the people who come in and just hearing the journeys they've been on and it just it makes me want to cry thinking about, I mean, you just think on your, you got to go to DMV and you think of what a headache it is when you have a, a computer with a printer and a file where your stuff is and it's still a pain or getting your doctor's things in order and then on top of it, you don't actually have a place. So, and then even with the, the coerced care, I think you call it, we know in working in this, you know, there's such a limit of places to send people, unfortunately. So even even when I admit, okay, maybe someone, as, as many supports are in place at my housing, there are times to see people really, they're beyond even what supportive housing can do for them. They need to be at that higher level of care. It really does not exist right now. Like there's such shortages in it that even that I'm a little skeptical of. If we don't really have places to send people and we don't really have that treatment and care to offer them, um, you know, and then I think it's just not very, you know, compassionate. And people, the people who are coming in, the one thing they really, when they come in off the streets, I, our staff are always really kind to them, and they touch them when they're helping them out. And you know, you see that 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 they just talk about how little compassion they've been dealt with. It. They've been treated like subhuman for so long, and it doesn't make them better. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't help them when they're out there. So. Uh <laughs> I'm going to just say something about coercive care, and it's just my own personal opinion at this point in time. Um, I think it's worth testing it out and seeing what we can do to get people who really need care, who are saying no, to take a step to get help for themselves. And if they can't do that on their own, and they're encouraged by the system, um, I think we should test it to see if there's some merit there. It's too difficult uh, without that uh, to get people moved into care that they might not need, that they just want to say no to. So let's experiment a little bit. We don't have all the answers. This is the big gnarly broad problem, everything <laughs> related to homelessness. So let's experiment. Okay. I, I just want to add one piece. What many times happens is when someone wants treatment, the bed is not available. We don't have enough of that. 
when they want to be able to have a safe place to be, or a couple of places really struggling with a mental health issue and a poor clinician is working, working with them, I challenge you to find a place where they can get the support and the help that they need. On-demand services for that level of care is just not there in our community. And I think that's the challenge is the narrative that people refuse services. The truth is when they want them and they ask for them, we can't deliver in a really intentional way. I don't know if any of you have ever had anyone in your family that's needed treatment. I have. And even with all of the connections and work that I have, it was very, very difficult to get my brother into treatment. And I know the system. So I just want to level set that it is also, again, a capacity piece as well. One quick one, and then one for you all to think about, because we're going to ask you to close today with your concluding thoughts. So the quick one is just, um, We've talked a little bit today about the idea of a centralized continuum of care throughout our region, throughout the county. And we understand that there's sort of silos. So um, how reasonable is it to think about um, what changes would need to happen to have this sort of centralized approach to a continuum of care? Um, if we can answer this one quickly, and then I'm going to leave you the concluding thoughts to think about as we leave, and then we're going to hit your questions. So as the continuum of care, we do have a centralized continuum of care, but what is challenging is that every city has its own budget, council, elected leaders, right? County has its own board who's over its own funding as well. Also on a state level, the state has its own legislative body that sets their budget and, and uh, what's accountable for their funding. So the challenge is what we have to do is pull all of those as closely together as we can, but you can't take their authority away from their funding. So it's the education, it's the coordination, it's the understanding of the approach. Cities are not gonna give up their money to someone else to make the decision. Counties are not, nor is the state or the federal government. So literally it's sort of through influence and, and um, collaboration, being able to centrally agree on at least goals and tenants, populations, and approach. And then they're responsible for their own funding, but the, the leaning in collectively is important. I think I, I okay. okay, so the thought I wanna leave you with to think about before we go to audience questions is, uh, what are realistic solutions that a league member could get behind whether it's things that are about to be signed in Sacramento or things we can do, that's, we would like to walk up, besides the hope you've all given us today, what are the things that we could do? So now I'm gonna transition, I'm gonna try to audience questions. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, so first I'll do a, um, let's see. Uh, I don't know how to answer this. It was a question about uh, coerced care. Uh, the league's position on this. I'm sorry, I don't really know the league's position on this, and uh, we would probably have to study it up and then um, speak about it. So I, I'm going to defer on that one. Um, let's see. Um, okay, there's a couple of easy softball ones, I think, for <laughs> Wakeland. Um, what does PSH stand for? Permanent Supportive Housing. PSH, Permanent Supportive Housing. Okay, we should get that one today. Um, and then this one's for Mary. How did Lennar work with HomeAid? What exactly did they do? I'm sorry. Lennar is the largest home builder in the country, and they are um, engaged in HomeAid nationally and in the local uh, affiliates across the country. Um, for us here in San Diego, um, they um, invested uh, through sponsorship dollars in our works construction training program. Um, they provide um, the instructors for our class. They provide the classroom to train our students. We take our students um, out on field trips um, and they provide the sites on their live sites. Um, they are really passionate about uh, helping us find solutions. Um, they love the idea of working with our at-risk uh, individuals who are ready to go back to work. 
Um, they've actually hired five of our graduates um, over the last year. Um, and I think they're learning also uh, about the challenging issue. It's not just about giving someone a job and there, off you go, you can rebuild your lives. Because they have five um, employees that are making their way through um, getting up and running as employees and then hit roadblocks um, that, that no one saw coming. Um, they're learning, a big company learning about what the challenges are, but they're, they're dedicated um, to this program uh, locally and at the national level. Okay. Um, a couple of questions regarding NIMBYism. How, what's the most effective way to combat that? So that is not in my backyard, NIMBYism. What are your thoughts about combating that? What have you seen be effective? Showing up at the community meetings, I need more people whose voice is supported uh, rather than the not in my backyard. It really is a community approach. You get enough supportive voices, you can get it done. Uh, and I think we have a silent uh, majority that supports addressing homelessness and we need those voices. We need you to show up. I find for me being able to have really beautiful examples of projects and people living in them that are willing to meet people. So I always just try to get people to my projects. You remember we got really fought in Claremont a few years back um, over a project that has turned out beautifully that the neighborhood loves that I get notes from neighbors saying how proud they are to have it there. But I mean, they were picketing in the streets. They were posting my home address. Like it was an ugly scene when those neighbors came out against and we took them to Talmadge, the one I showed the first one here. They met the people that live there. When you look in the eyes and really meet someone who's experienced homelessness and hear their story and see them as human beings and see, you know, because so much of it is fear um, when people object, either fear, sometimes a realistic fear that I'm happy to address of, you know, what's it going to be like to have people who've been homeless as neighbors? You know, is this, this you know, is it going to be safe? What kind of things? I'm, I'm happy to talk about those things. Sometimes it's fear of your property values. I'm a little less patient with that. Um, although we know that it does not affect your property values to have affordable and supportive housing. So um, I think that, I think, you know, you can push people to, hey, there's, there's really positive examples of it out there. It's not something to be fearful of. And it is good, as Tamara said, it's great to have a diverse community. You want to have all kinds of different people living in your neighborhood. It's way more fun. So. I think people used to be a lot more um, engaged in their, their city councils, their planning mm -hmm. commissions, their committee development groups. We need to get back to that. We need to start showing up at these meetings and advocating for these issues. Um, I heard Rebecca was going to be <coughs> on the town council in, in my neighborhood. I thought, I got to get over there, you know, to make sure that if there's a, you know, an outcry, she's building a, a new project in Ocean Beach, that I'm going to be there to defend her. I mean, I just knew that I, I had to be there. But it was, it was a very calm group, which I was delighted by. Um, so start showing up. And the league, I mean, you know, you know how this works, and you're already doing that as well. OK, here's a, I think, an easy solution, more money, right? So the county is having an experimental pilot program about um, funding for preventative actions to keep people in their home. A small amount of money that often will make a big difference. What are your thoughts? And it's only a pilot program. So what are your thoughts about, um, do you see that being a long running solution to solve a temporary problem? Or what are your thoughts about this idea of preventative a little bit of money right now? So I think the one that we're talking about in the county is probably the one for our seniors. It's a shallow subsidy. And we know that they need that, right? I think targeted approaches that can keep people in their homes work. We know that. We've seen it. Uh, the uh, support service for veteran families do it as well. Uh, a small amount in someone's house. It is far cheaper and easier and less traumatic if we keep people in their homes. The challenge is that you can't base it on poverty. You have to base it on a population's need in a really intentional way to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm all for those kinds of programs. I mean, in addition to running a lot of supportive housing, I have a lot of family housing. I have a lot of just housing for low-income seniors. And we see the way things spiral, right? So if you're a low-income family and your car breaks down, that can be the beginning of the end for you because you know, 
the littlest things, you know, it, it, that, that you, now you're going to miss your dog, now you're going to da da And so, like, that, that sometimes is what causes them ultimately to lose their housing. So those things we can do to help people with those crises, help them with their utility bill payments, help them with the things that can not then lead to that poverty spiral of now everything is just going to be gone, I'm, I'm really I'm supportive of it. And this is one of those things, let's experiment. Let's see if mm -hmm. it works. If it works, let's keep it going. Mm -hmm. It'll work. Yeah. I'm just going to tell you a place that during the pandemic that we did assassination fabulously, and it didn't cost us any money. The earned income tax credit, which is for working families, that usually at the end of filing your taxes, then you file for it and you get a large amount back. Um, through the pandemic, the federal government actually puts that out as a monthly payment to folks that qualified for it didn't cost us anything. So if you want to advocate for some of those things, that sort of level of universal income that came out of the earned income tax credit, it's just a change in how they do business and they've proved through the pandemic that they could do it. Being able to take that to the next level for like a senior population before they're eligible for their social security could change our landscape. It's the reason we didn't see a lot of homeless increases through the pandemic and a large jump that's been happening afterwards. So there are policies and practices that don't cost us new amounts of money. We just need to look at it differently. So these two questions really deal with the idea of HUD, housing and urban development, and the funding that they provide, which is the form of subsidy for um, housing here locally. And, uh, you know, we know uh, anecdotally, it's about a 10, 10 to 15 year waiting list to uh, get that subsidy if you can find a landlord that would accept it. And so um, the questions are regarding, there's been no discussion of public housing. Shouldn't government be in the business of building housing? Well, I'm super yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in a way, everything I do is public housing in that it's deeply funded by the government. So it, it really is, it is a public-private partnership because I end up with federal, state, local funding in a, in a big way. I think that that really it is, and it is to some extent public. As to whether they should be running it, I don't think that's ever gone that great, actually. I think that's kind of where if you think to a lot back to the, the kind of the projects of the 70s when people have like a bad idea of it, it's that's, that the government's not really great at those day-to-day -day operations things. So I, I think, you know, as far as them running it, no, but they are already really funding it and subsidizing it and participating in it. And the vouchers are, are an enormous part. So there's two kinds of vouchers. There's rental vouchers that can go straight to a person that they can then take to go try to find a landlord. Or like in all of my permanent supportive housing and a lot of my other projects are actually attached to my project. So when someone moves in, it's just guaranteed that they're only gonna have to pay 30% of their income to rent, but I get paid a higher rent amount by the government so that I can actually keep my uh, project afloat. And they're, they're wildly essential. They're super helpful. It's a great thing to always be advocating for at the federal level is to try to get more of those vouchers out there. Mm -hmm. I would just say when we talked about this being years of bad policy, one of them was cutting HUD's investment on a federal level. In the 80s, it was cut to about 10% of their uh, original budget. That's why we don't have enough uh, housing choice vouchers, or as we know, is Section 8. It is really getting that federal budget back to a level Then we don't have a 10-year or if you're not one of the prioritized populations, a 15-year wait list for something that you qualified for. So that's another place that we can really advocate. It's also why when they stopped funding HUD at that level that we started to see increases in homelessness. There were substantial policy changes that happened in the 80s. And when you underfund, the housing and urban development on a federal level, we all pay for it in our communities. We've got some specific questions left, which I am actually going to send by email to the persons they were directed to, and we will be glad to share um, the responses that we get. But now I'm going to take us for just probably about five minutes of wrap up by each of you of what would you send us forth to do. You've already mentioned a lot, if you could sort of recapture that, and then Rosette is going to take us out. Start with you. I think we talked about a lot of those. The level of involvement that you're having is really important. Understanding the system, most people don't take the time to really learn about this work. So I, I um, compliment you on that and any connection and support we can give you as you put those goals together. Uh, the policy work on a state level, really we need an ongoing funding source at the state. Lots of states have done it. We also need ongoing local funding. 
uh, if we really want to address this because we know our, our cost of living and our housing costs are really high. You can advocate for things like the earned income tax credit being a monthly space, engaging with your local elected officials, making sure that they know that you're supportive of the best practices and policies, including housing first. It is taking a, a drumming right now, even locally. Uh, and it literally is just this, that people do better when they're housed first, and then we're gonna address everything else. That is kind of a core tenet that you can help it and lean into. And also, I, I, I think it's important to remain hopeful in this work. This is a problem we can solve. It is a problem that takes sort of that community engagement and really leaning into the solutions and not being fearful of an investment if we make the right level for the length of time, it will actually catch up with the need, which is really important. Well, I think you all are already doing so much. Uh, so just keep going there, get deeper, educate, um, educate the membership, edu educate the community at large. Um, we used to have bigger gatherings before the pandemic. Um, and I, I think that's when I started going to the league events. Um, and there were people from, you know, there were a couple hundred people um, at your lunches um, and they were very educational. It's important, especially as our democracy is being stress tested. Um, it, you know, it's on the League of Women Voters as an organization who has that mission to educate more and more. Um, beyond just the League of Women Voters uh, membership. This is kind of cheesy, but I think honestly being like ambassadors of compassion like really <laughs> is a super helpful thing because, and like I say, people have been wondering why I'm so frustrated by this sort of anti-housing first narrative that's out there. I've been doing affordable housing for 25 years. Why is this particularly under my skin? And it really is. And it's because it's this victim blaming, right? So it's saying like, again, like it's, it's around the streets, it's their fault. Like, and it, it, it lets us off the hook. And it's also, it's like a semantics thing too. Oh, let's talk about, let's, let's instead spend a lot of time talking about if housing first works. And I think like, oh my gosh, 25 years ago, we were talking about, I was saying like, we need affordable housing. And they're like, oh, should we call it workforce or should we call it affordable? Is it big A, is it small A, is it natural occurring? We spent 10 years dithering around on, on names and we didn't do inclusionary policies or loopies or any of the stuff that would have helped with move damage. So I feel like my head's gonna explode. So like nobody listens. We just spent all the time dithering around talking instead. I do think like at the heart of it is the lack of compassion in that argument and the lack of remembering that these are people and they've gone through things and they have stories. Like they're all their stories, you know. They've got stories and they're relatable. They're very relatable. And so I think spreading that as you go about it and counter, just try to counter that idea that it's the people's fault, that they're refusing something, that they're making a choice to be there, which is so silly. You know, that, they're, that this is a conscious choice that people want to live this way. And the more you can do around that. And then a, we are going to be having a local in the city of San Diego a revenue measure coming out on the 2024 ballot. So stay tuned. We're still working on some some details, but that's going to be a chance to have a permanent ongoing source of funding in San Diego, and it will be a game changer. I cannot tell you as a developer how refreshing it would be to just know there's going to be consistently funding year after year in San Diego with consistent priorities that we could plan around. So those kinds of things always, if we support them, please do. <laughs> um, well, so it has been our honor to have uh, these three distinguished uh, panelists speak to us today, tell us so much about um, the situation here in San Diego County. Thank you again so much for being here. We do have um, for our three non-league uh, panelists. <laughs> sort of tokens of our appreciation. Um, so, I think we heard a little a bit about what we might do. Stay informed, get educated, advocate, which is what we have been doing and we will continue to do. And uh, we will be really, really um, eager to see what this ballot measure is gonna be looking like. We'll probably be presenting on that ballot measure, a, a pro and con, we're always um, measured and objective uh, when, whenever we do that. But. We encourage you to get involved, stay informed. If you're not a member, become a member of either the San Diego League or the North County League, depending on where you live. And uh, we'll be here for a little bit. Please feel free to come up and talk to me and maybe they'll fill some questions and 
there are league members around for those of you who are not league members. Thank you again for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. And have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you.